it's definitely an honor to be here. Um, and thank you so very much to Burlington Public Health Department for um, inviting me uh, to speak this evening with all of you. I'm really appreciative um, of the work that all of you do for our town, um, especially during this past year uh, with the pandemic. Um, so as Sandra mentioned, um, my name is Jennifer O'Reardon. I currently serve as the Radiation Safety Officer um, and the Director of Health Physics and Radiation Safety um, at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center in Burlington, PB, and also the Lexington site. Um, and I love radiation, right? That's my job. <laughs> um, so it's important for me. Um, Sorry, I'm going to turn off the air conditioner behind me. Um, so it's important for me uh, to be able to perform public outreach such as this lecture uh, to make sure the general public and especially um, it really important groups like the BBRC aware uh, that we live in a radioactive world um, and that we use these materials and machines which produce radiation in our town for the betterment of our, of our society. So radiation tends to get a bad rap um, and sometimes we really only hear about the bad things that happen. So um, hopefully tonight we can uh, call some of that. So I would like to share my screen if that's possible. Um, let me see if that works. I have this here. I just wanna make sure everybody can see the beginning. All right, and everybody see that? All right, great. Um, so the title of the presentation, again, is Radiation in Every Day Life. Um, so as I mentioned before, radiation tends to get kind of a bad rap, and sometimes we only hear about the bad things that happen. Um, so if you were to simply Google uh, the word radiation or the word nuclear, an array of somewhat disturbing images um, often typically it will appear uh, on your screen before you. So in fact, um, the public perception of radiation is, is so negative um, that there was a study done in 2017 um, by Dr. Thomas um, and a group over there in England um, that showed that the, the very negative perception of radiation uh, within our society has actually consistently led to poor public health decisions, um, which unfortunately have resulted in impacts that are significantly more detrimental and far reaching than radiation exposure itself. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting that just this perception um, of radiation is so negative that, that it's, it's impacted people that uh, even more so. So uh, nuclear and radiation science are not easily simplified um, and can often be kind of confusing for people. Um, so the expectation um, for tonight's lecture is simply to provide you all with a really broad overview of radiation. Um, we're not going to graduate with our with our PhDs in radiation science tonight, but we're just going to get a really broad overview of radiation, how and when it's used most commonly. Um, and then hopefully I can leave you all with some um, good resources. So if you want to dig deeper into any of the particular topics that we discussed tonight, um, you can understand those on a higher level um, and with confidence with the, with the resources that I'll leave with you. Um, I'm also hoping um, that this lecture will kind of provide us with a foundation that we can build upon for future more specific uh, presentations. Uh, late last year, I had proposed that Leahy host a radiological emergency exercise or drill um, in conjunction with our local, state, and federal partners. Obviously, the pandemic has put that on hold for a bit, um, but I think that if we could use this time to better educate ourselves and prepare ourselves for that type of exercise or, God forbid, event, um, we can be much more successful at the exercise when we go through it, um, and we'll be able to identify some higher level issues when we actually do go through the exercise as opposed to starting at square one. Um, so tonight, we'll start with a little bit of history about radiation, the discovery of radiation, how we got to where we are today. Um, then we'll pop on our lab coats and pocket protectors. Uh, and go over the basics of radiation science, what radiation is, where it comes from, how we're exposed to it, and how we can protect ourselves. Um, then we'll explore how radiation is utilized um, in our everyday lives. Uh, we'll very briefly, just one slide or two, um, discuss some of the malevolent uses of radiation. Um, then we'll wrap up with a Q&A session I saw um, that Sarah popped in the chat box. Please uh, save your questions until the end if possible. Um, and if we don't have the time to get to all of them in the chat, then I will absolutely respond to them in writing and hopefully we can get them out to the participants following the lecture. Um, and again, I'll do my best to, to address each of them to the best of my ability or at least direct you uh, in, in, in the right 
in the right way so you can find the answers. Uh, so we'll start with a little bit of history. Um, so up on the left-hand side of the screen is Wilhelm Röntgen. Um, he actually accidentally discovered uh, what he went on to call x-rays. Um, immediately after his discovery, it was put to good use. The picture next to him there is actually a picture of an x-ray of his wife's hand that was one of the first x-rays ever taken. Um, so shortly after he discovered that, um, Henry Becquerel discovered that uranium salts give off similar rays naturally. So even though Henry Becquerel discovered the phenomenon, his uh, doctoral student, Marie Curie, um, which I highly recommend watching the uh, new docudrama that is out about her. It's very, very interesting. Um, she went on to call it radioactivity. She and her husband, uh, Pierre, were awarded the Nobel Prize twice. Um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in physics and also in chemistry for their discovery of radium and polonium, which are still in use to this day. Um, so she also conducted some, some great work in pioneering radiology, developing and using uh, mobile x-ray machines uh, during World War I, which was almost unheard of at the time. So very shortly after this was discovered, it was starting to be refined and used uh, for medical use. So one of the early misconceptions about radiation, it was just, you know, um, because it was so new, was that they really believed that the radiation, if they injected it into people or if they exposed people to it, that they believed at that time that it only attacked useless tissue um, and then was ejected from people's bodies. Um, so there was this idea that radiation only did good things. Um, and because of that, uh, we kind of went through this radium craze, I like to call it, where the recreational use of radiation, which we never hear about that today, um, was a little bit more popular. So there was radium cosmetics, there was hand cream, there was um, you know, a radium solution that you could squeeze up your nose to reduce hay fever. Um, one of the more popular substances that, that they were uh, peddling at the time in the 1920s was actually radium water. Um, and so they sold this in cases of 30. So it was a month, month long supply. So you could have a drink every day um, of this radium water. And it contained quite quite a bit of radium actually. Um, and so until the 1930s and Time Magazine in 1932 actually ran an article uh, about a gentleman, he was from Pittsburgh and he was all about the radium water. He drank it every day. He had bragged very frequently about he, how he had drank over 1,400 bottles of it and it made him feel very robust. Well, unfortunately, he passed away from radiation poisoning. Um, so by the 1930s, they realized, hey, maybe it's not only attacking the bad stuff in our bodies, maybe it's attacking our whole bodies. Um, one of the other uses of, of radium um, throughout history that was you know, again, kind of used right away for the war efforts was the use of radium paint. Um, there have also been some some great books and shows that have come out about the radium girls. Um, if you've never heard of that, I would definitely um, suggest looking it up. It's it's very interesting, kind of a heartbreaking story about these these women who worked in factories who were painting radium dials for the war effort um, so that soldiers and airmen could see um, the dials in their planes and on their machines and not have to turn on lights, risking being um, you know, seen by the enemy on the, on the war field. Um, and so the dials themselves were not dangerous to the people that were looking at them, but the girls who were painting the dials were instructed to actually take the paintbrushes and to get a very fine tip, they were instructed to dip it um, in their mouth, dip it into the paint, and then dip it back in their mouth again. So these women, um, you know, over the course of several years, ingested massive amounts um, of radium, and they weren't really given any safety precautions. Um, there are stories of them, you know, painting things in their hair and their faces, and then going out, you know, after work, um, and it was kind of like seen almost as glamorous. I mean, unfortunately, within several years, uh, many of these women died and had very serious bone cancers as a result. Um, so by the end of the 1920s, so around 1928, um, they really started to notice that people who were using radiation and x-rays quite a bit um, were starting to see some problems. So some of the people that were, you know, again, the radium dial painters. So around 1928, the ICRP, the International Council on Radiation Protection was established. Um, and as we all know, working in healthcare for different boards and things like that, sometimes once you establish something, it can take a while for different um, recommendations and, and policies and procedures to come out. Um, so the recreational use of radiation did continue, but at least they were noticing that, you know, there needed to be some rules and regulations on using it. In the upper left-hand corner, again, um, you can see a shoe-fitting fluoroscope. So these were popular in the U.S. from the 1920s, believe it or not, up 
in some places up until the 1970s. Um, and it was just kind of a novelty um, where you could go to the shoe store um, and there were three viewing ports. You would pop your feet um, in there and then you could make sure that your shoes were fitting the right way. Um, so my grandmother actually, I recall as a kid, her talking about, oh, I wish they still had those x-ray shoe fitting machines. I would go to the shoe store every day and look inside. Um, and, you know, it, they were actually really blasting people with quite a bit of radiation, uh, much more so than you would even get in a, a diagnostic scan today if you were to go get one. Um, and so th those were banned in Massachusetts in the 1950s. They decided that only physicians could operate fluoroscopy. I would argue that that's a pretty good de decision on the part of Massachusetts. Um, but there, you know, these were actually up in use up until about the 1970s. Um, uranium was used in depression glass, uranium glass, which will actually glow under a dark light. Some people collect it, some people don't know they have it. Um, and in the bottom right hand corner um, there's a picture of some um, some fiesta wear um, so in the early 1930s up until the 70s fiesta wear actually used um, both pure uranium and um, depleted uranium in the glaze um, and so if you have any of that at home which I do and I'll show you a quick demo in a second um, you can actually tell when it was produced based on how much of a radiation reading you get off of it um, so I'm going to un um, you guys still hear me? Okay. All right, good. Sarah, I can see your face on my screen, so I'm going to rely on your head nods for this one. So I have my trusty Geiger counter, which I assume everyone has at home, right? No. Um, so I have this here. Not sure if you can hear the clicks. Turn up the a little bit. Maybe you can hear the beeping. Well, um, I have some of that Fiesta work from the 1930s. So I put this up to it. You guys hear that now? The Geiger counter, it really screams. Um, I also have some depression glass here, um, which it makes it click a little bit more. If you're trained to use these types of pieces of equipment, you can pick up on the fact that it's reading more. Um, if I had a black light, I'd be able to show you that it could actually glow in the dark as well as it's underneath um, that black light. So again, um, in the 1970s, they stopped producing the Fiesta wear with the uranium glass. You can still buy orange Fiesta wear, but it, um, the newer stuff does not have the uranium content inside. So I'm gonna pop my headphones on. All right. Now. All right. Um, so that takes us up until the 19, 50s, 1960s. Um, we're gonna backtrack a little bit um, and go back to, um, World War II, which really prompted the research that led to the um, to the atomic bombs. Um, there were several deadly accidents that took place during this research, um, and that had led to a lot of the implementation of some of the workplace safety and nuclear security standards that we follow even today. Um, so the development and use of nuclear weapons also led to the research um, on radio protectors. So after the bombs went off um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, many companies many countries were scrambling um, to develop something that they could give to the soldiers in the field so that if, while they were out, um, if they saw the mushroom cloud, they could take almost a magic pill, if you will, that could protect them from the radiation. So that led to the uh, development of amidphosphine, um, which is currently used um, for astronauts for long space travel because they get quite a dose of radiation once they've left the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and we also use it in uh, for cancer patients as well, a little bit of a different setting, but it's kind of a scavenger. It takes those free radicals and it can protect you somewhat um, from doses of radiation. The side effects are nasty though, um, so it's not something that we would necessarily um, you know, give out give out in mass, um, but it's still kind of interesting that that developed. Um, in the 1970s, um, that brought about some wonderful advancements in medical imaging uh, using x-rays and computers. The Nobel Prize was awarded um, for CT machines, and these machines have made a huge difference um, in the medical diagnosis and treatment planning. Um, unfortunately, in the 1980s, uh, we had Chernobyl, which took place, which impacted Russia, Eastern Europe, um, probably the most, but, you know, it impacted the entire world. Um, and because of the poor and untransparent response to this very preventable incident, it played a huge role um, in tarnishing the benefits of nuclear power and brought kind of brought the fear back of radiation and it was very that was a much very much alive after the um the nuclear attacks in in japan um so again that radiophobia came back you know in good measure because of what had happened in chernobyl um so bringing us to modern day um obviously the probably the most recent thing in people's memories is uh the fukushima incident um what people sometimes fail to remember and I, you know i struggled with this at first was 
the um, in 2011, it was really the tsunami that devastated everything in Japan. So I think sometimes people saw images on the news of Japan just, you know, in that whole area being totally flattened and totally ruined. Um, and people thought, oh, it's because of the power plant. Well, it was one of the largest earthquakes and tsunamis to ever hit Japan um, in, in modern history. And that, that played a huge role, obviously, um, in why the power plant kind of broke down and, and wasn't working any longer. Um, but on a positive note, there have been some huge advances in nuclear imaging um, and cancer therapies. We're able to use much lower doses of radiation or utilize much more precise techniques. Um, and hopefully we'll continue on that path. Um, but I just think it's interesting, thanks for indulging me in the history of radiation for a minute. I think it's interesting um, before we get into the nitty gritty science, to kind of see how, you know, something that was just an accident in a lab that they didn't even really know what it was. They just called it x-ray. Oh, that's kind of cool. You can do this with it. Um, that, you know, in, in just a little over a hundred years, how many advancements have been made um, that have really benefited our society. And obviously there's been some tragic things that have happened as well, um, but it's, it's really interesting to see how far we've come um, in, with the history of, of radiation science. So um, we'll switch gears here for a second um, and we'll talk a little bit more about radiation science. We'll get into the basics of it. What is it? What happens when you're exposed to it? Uh, what are the risks? Um, so what is radiation? Um, radiation is energy, comes from a source, travels through space, and can penetrate through different materials depending on its mass and its energy. Um, unstable atoms are said to be radioactive. When anything is unstable, it wants to become stable, so it releases energy, um, and that's what that, that radioactivity is. Um, so radiation can be ionizing or non-ionizing. Um, and this little chart up here uh, that you can you know, find pretty much anywhere, um, kind of shows what's ionizing, what's non-ionizing. The focus of this evening's lecture is on ionizing radiation. Um, and the reason that we're focusing on ionizing radiation tonight um, is because it's highly energetic, it can remove electrons, um, and it can cause damage to cells. So what's inside of our cells that we care about? Our DNA. So it can really cause some pretty serious damage um, to, our, to our DNA. Um, radiation can be man-made, or occur naturally. Um, and we're all exposed to radiation every day. So it's not like it's something that's just hidden inside of a bunker that we take out once in a while to treat patients with. Uh, natural radiation is actually everywhere. Um, so all of us are exposed to it every day from natural sources such as minerals in the ground and, and man-made sources such as x-rays. Um, everybody receives an average dose per year um, on the EPA's website. Um, if you go onto the radiation website, and I'll give you the, the link for it, you can actually calculate what your personal radiation dose is every year, it's just an average. Um, but most of the natural radiation dose that we get every year comes from the Earth's crust in the form of radon and thoron. So that's about 37% of our natural background. Um, you know, space background, internal background. So all of us have, we actually have radioisotopes inside of us. So some potassium, um, K40, is radioactive. So it's not like in our own... Uh, radiation that we have in our bodies all the time, um, and different building materials if they have, again, uranium or thorium inside of them, they could be rather, you know, high in, in those contents and they can emit some radiation as well. So we do live in a radioactive world, and I think it's important to mention that because sometimes even healthcare workers, I'm um, at the hospital where I, work, where I work, they're very afraid of radiation, they don't think they should ever be exposed, um, you know, but most of them get more radiation just from walking around outside uh, than they do from even working around materials uh, in the hot labs at work. Um, so there's different types of radiation. Um, so we have alpha radiation, beta radiation, um, neutron radiation, those are particulate radiations, and then our electromagnetic radiation, which are gamma and x-rays. Um, so gamma and x-rays are pretty much the same thing except for how they're formed. Um, but the alpha particles, the beta particles, and the neutrons are interesting concepts as well. So alpha particles, they're big, they're heavy, they don't travel very far. Um, you could actually hold an alpha um, source in your hand, it's not even going to penetrate your skin. Uh, however, if you were to take that same alpha source and drink it and ingest it into your body where you didn't have the protection of your skin, it could pack a really powerful punch. Um, so a few years ago, I believe it was in 2007, um, a former Russian agent Litvinenko, so some people may be familiar with this story, uh, was poisoned with uh, polonium over in England. Um, and the people that brought the polonium into the restaurant where they met him for tea, they were able to carry it. They couldn't even detect it with radiation detectors because, again, it's kind of a slow, um, you know, not super energetic uh, particle. They were able to pour it into his tea. He drank it, and once it was inside of his body, um, it just kind of attacked the, you know, 
the GI lining, his lungs, etc. Um, so it packs a powerful punch if it's ingested, but outside of the body it doesn't cause any problems. Um, a place where you can find alpha particles in your home, believe it or not, um, is in smoke detectors. Um, so because they can be shielded with paper or smoke, um, they use alpha particles to create a current. Um, and if that current is broken with smoke, so if smoke goes up from the kitchen like it does when I cook. Um, it will block those alpha particles from emitting um, and it will stop the electromagnetic current and that will cause it to beep. So we all have alpha sources in our home. Um, again, it's not dangerous, um, you know, unless you take it off the wall and crunch it up and eat it. And there's other issues going on there if you're doing things like that. Um, but that's where you could find alpha sources in everyday life. Um, Beta sources, again, they can travel through paper. They're a little more energetic. They're used for cancer therapy, so we can actually implant them into patients. Um, and they travel just far enough to attack, you know, a certain distance within a tumor, um, but they don't necessarily go any further. And we have uh, special dosimetrists and physicists that do those calculations to make sure that's done. Um, gamma and x-ray, many people are familiar with x-rays. They're used for imaging, you know, travel through our body. Um, and neutrons um, as well. We don't use neutrons at the hospital, uh, but there are some neutron therapies out there. And you actually need concrete um, or very thick water um, shields to block neutrons. So those are the different types of radiation. Again, how energetic they are um, and how far they travel is really dependent on their mass and their energy. Um, and this is part of the reason why some people are so intimidated by radiation. Um, and it can be very convoluted because you could have an event where you only have beta particles or an event where you have x-rays or neutrons. Um, and so a lot of people like a one size fits all, um, you know, kind of response for things. But when it comes to radiation, you kind of have to know what you're dealing with, and then you can go go from there. Um, so the electromagnetic radiations, like I mentioned, X-rays are produced outside of the nucleus, gamma rays are produced inside of a nucleus, but everything that we ever say about X-rays applies um, equally to gamma rays. And I'm sure if there's a you know double PhD in, in nuclear physics, they're mad that I just said that, but for all intended purposes, um, X-rays and, and gamma rays are, are pretty much the same exact thing. So we know what they are. How can we be exposed to radiation? So there's two different ways that you can be exposed to radiation. You can become contaminated by the particles. So contamination is basically radioactive materials where you don't want them. Um, so if I walk into nuclear medicine at the hospital and they have a vial of technetium 99N, which is a M, which is uh, an isotope that we use for imaging purposes, and I take that vial, this is not really tech, it's glitter, um, and I were to dump it on my hands, my hands are now contaminated with technetium 99M. Um, so they are radioactive and they're contaminated. The only way to get rid of that contamination is to move it from one place to the other. So sometimes there's a misconception that you can kill the radiation. So people will say, well, I'll just use the you know hand sanitizer. Um, but if I have glitter on my hands and then I put hand sanitizer on, I'm just kind of spreading it around. So if you do think that you're contaminated with radiation, you have to move it off of yourself through washing and we prefer it to go down the drain. Um, the other way that you can become exposed to radiation is just irradiation. So you're being exposed to a radioactive source, there's no direct contact, you do not become radioactive. So this is an example of you're riding your bike, uh, you fall down, you think you broke your wrist, you go to the hospital, you get an x-ray on your hand, your hand does not become radioactive. You're not, you're not radioactive, but you have been exposed um, to that radiation. So that's the different ways that you can become exposed, which is contamination or irradiation. And it's really important to know the difference. This is something um, that I like to, to stress with first responders. Um, if they're responding to something, if they think they have people that are contaminated, they're going to respond very differently um, than if they're people who have just been exposed to a source. Does the type of dose, you know, dose, the exposure that you get, does the, does the kind of dose matter? Um, and absolutely it does. Um, so when we talk about exposure to radiation, we talk about either an acute dose, which is a really big dose of radiation over a very short period of time. Um, when we talk about chronic doses, which is really any dose, doesn't matter if it's big or small, but if it's spread out over months, years, your lifetime, and the example of that would be background radiation, right? We walk around every day, um, you know, we're exposed to building materials, we're exposed to the earth crust, we're exposed to cosmic rays, um, if it's spread out over time. So does the type of dose matter in how your body responds to being exposed um, to radiation? Um, and the answer is yes. So any time that intera uh, radiation interacts with tissue, the either passes right through and there's no permanent damage um, or it forms some free radicals. So to be clear, radiation is not the only thing that causes, <laughs> causes damage. There are other things that can cause the formation of free radicals. Um, but when we're talking about 
ionizing radiation, um, forming free radicals, a couple different things can happen. Those free radicals can be repaired um, or it can cause DNA damage. Um, and the DNA damage can then go on to be repaired. Um, our body has some amazing um, repair mechanisms um, out there that can repair the DNA that happens to get damaged. But if the DNA stays damaged, two different things can happen. Um, you can have cell death, um, and that's called a deterministic effect, or you can have a permanent DNA alteration. Um, so what are kind of the effects of either this cell death or this permanent DNA alteration? Um, and this is usually the, the part of my lecture. I have a 10-year-old son, and whenever he sits in on these, he gets really mad when I talk about this um, <laughs> because I have to, to have to say that um, one of the biggest misconceptions about radiation, and this is again um, thanks to Hollywood and the media, is that radiation exposure does not cause any new or unique malformations. Um, so unfortunately, you will not turn into Spider-Man or the Hulk. Um, I'm willing to play along, you know, if you really want me to, but um, in real life, you will not turn into Spider-Man or the Hulk. So what are the health effects of radiation exposure? Um, so again, we know that anytime that cellular damage occurs, it could become, you know, your cells could become destroyed or mutated. There's two different types of effects. Um, there's those deterministic effects or stochastic. The big difference between these two um, is the threshold um, at which you will see these effects. So for deterministic effects, the severity of the effect increases with dose. Um, so the example that I'll give for a deterministic effect would be a skin burn. Um, people who undergo radiation therapy um, for cancer, for other um, medical issues, the higher the dose they get, sometimes they will see skin burns depending on where they're being treated. The higher the dose, the worse the skin injury. Um, but there is a practical threshold. If you don't go over a certain dose, you won't see any skin injury. Um, but the probability of occurrence definitely increases with that dose. So that's a deterministic effect. Other examples of uh, deterministic effects in addition to skin injury um, are cataracts. So that's a big one that, that comes up when people say, oh, well, I got over a certain dose, so the probability of me getting cataracts um, is even higher. Um, the most commonly known health effect of radiation exposure is the stochastic effect, which is cancer. Um, so the severity of the stochastic effect is completely independent of the dose. There's no threshold, um, but the probability of occurrence does increase with dose. So the more radiation dose you get, the more probable you are um, to get cancer as a result. However, um, you don't get really bad cancer or kind of okay cancer. You either get it or you don't. Obviously, um, and actually many people don't know this, um, you know, there are, are many, cancer is multifactorial, so you don't get it just from radiation exposure. There's many different factors. There are certain people who are predisposed to, to getting cancer, being more sensitive to radiation, um, but the probability, again, increases with dose. Um, and how we know these different effects take place, um, there have obviously been human studies that have done, unfortunately, um, on the folks that were involved with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, some of the early radiographers and early x-ray users um, from the, you know, the 1920s to the 1940s and 50s were able to, to look at what they were exposed to and what they experienced. Um, and then there have been many animal and in vivo and in vitro studies done as well to kind of uh, figure out what those thresholds, thresholds are. Um, so those are the, the, the big risks. Um, but I like to make sure that people keep their risks in perspective um, because a lot we face risks every single day, we wake up, we eat something, um, we shower, hopefully, right? Uh, go to work, um, and we get in our car, we drive to work, we ride our bike to work, we walk to work. We, fa we, we take chances and we take risks with every single thing that we do. Um, so I, it's really important not to bloviate the fears around radiation. Um, so if we look at this list of different things, these activities, and we think about which one of them do you think has a relative risk of a one in a million chance of dying? So if you smoke 1.4 cigarettes, that's pretty specific. Um, you know, what do you have a one in a million chance of dying of lung cancer from just smoking that, that 1.4 cigarettes? Um, eating 40 tablespoons of peanut butter, so you could get some kind of botulism or you could get some sort of, um, you know, sickness from eating peanut butter or having an allergic reaction. Spending two days in New York City and breathing in the air pollution, um, driving 40 miles in a car and dying in an accident, canoeing for six minutes, 
Um, again, these are all pretty, pretty specific with a one in a million chance of dying, um, but all of them have this same risk. So we all take these risks every day. And so it's important to be aware of what we're doing and what those risks are so that we don't you know, overreact to certain risks. Um, sometimes we'll have patients come into the hospital and they'll say, I don't wanna have this, this x-ray done of my arm because I'm gonna die of cancer from this. Um, yet, you know, they drove 80 miles down the highway to get to the hospital while they were smoking a cigarette on the way, right? So we really have to think about what our risks are um, and, and keep them in perspective and be, be aware of how we can reduce those risks if we can. Um, so what's the best way for us to do that? Again, be aware, uh, be your own advocate, ask lots of questions, uh, prepare and educate yourself. One of the best things, you know, we, if we go back to that slide, um, talking about one of the the highest uh, forms of background radiation has to do with radon. Radon. So we're actually fairly lucky in Massachusetts that our our EPA group in Massachusetts takes radon very seriously. Um, there's a lot of information about it. Other states don't take it as seriously, and there have been some. Don't want to use the word. Um, epidemic, but that might be appropriate, of people moving into homes and neighborhoods that were never tested and then lots of people dying from lung cancer as a result. So radon is the second leading um, cause of lung cancer death um, in the United States and globally. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that you can educate yourself about. You can get a fairly inexpensive radon test for your home and it's as simple as just ventilating it out if you end up having it, having it and that can make a really big difference um, in your exposure uh, to radon. So that's just one example. Um, so so we know a little bit now, um, in very basic terms, what radiation is, what the potential health effects of exposure are. So where can we find it? Um, is it limited to these secret labs? Um, in hospitals, as we discussed earlier, it can be naturally occurring. Um, and there's some fairly common objects in your home. So I talked a little bit about the smoke detector, um, the depression glass, the old Fiesta where um, bananas actually have um, higher levels of um, K40, which is potassium 40. So you would need something like 5,000 bananas to, if you, to hold a Geiger counter up to to actually get a reading from. So you'd probably have to go to like the seaport and they come in with a big shipment of them, um, but you can actually detect them. Um, one of the most radioactive foods out there is actually Brazil nuts. So that's something that people usually eat during the holidays. Um, and if there is a big display of them, I've seen sometimes at um, like Whole Foods or places like that, they'll have big displays of Brazil nuts you can grab. If you do have a Geiger counter, you can hold it up to it, um, you know, and detect it. I, I don't recommend that. Um, people will look at you strangely, but you can get a reading if you want to. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we are living in a radioactive world. Um, so radiation and medicine, radiation research, nuclear power, and just industrial and commercial use. I'll go through a few of these things again, just to familiarize people with it. Um, so on the medical side, um, we use radiation um, for diagnostic and for therapeutic purposes. So we've come a really long way um, from Renkin grabbing his wife's hand in the lab and saying, let me get an x-ray of your hand and your ring. Um, and we've also come a long way from, there was a scene um, in the, the radioactive movie that just came out about Marie and Pierre Curie, where Pierre actually taped a piece of radiation to his arm and wanted to see how long it would take for his skin to get really red and, and burn. Um, so we've come a really long way um, from that. Um, but because now we understand that there's some risk affiliated with that radiation exposure, um, we always operate under the principle um, that the benefit to the patient absolutely has to outweigh the risk um, of being exposed to radiation, even though we're using smaller and smaller quantities to achieve um, some of these images and therapies, we always have to make sure that the benefit outweighs the risk. Um, so on the diagnostic side, we will talk a little bit about nuclear medicine and imaging with x-rays, and then we'll just go through a couple common therapies. Um, one example that I like to give of benefit outweighing the risk is, is if we have a patient arrive, they've been in a motor vehicle accident, we're not sure if there's internal bleeding or damage. Um, so there's a couple different ways to figure that out. Um, we could do exploratory surgery, which would be very specific uh, to the area of the patient. I'm, I can't see everyone's faces, but I'm sure if there's physicians on this, that they're laughing because you would never really do that. Um, but when we talk about doing exploratory surgery to figure out if something is wrong, we're talking about the risk of being under anesthesia. We're talking about the risk of infection. We're talking about the risk of doing further damage to the patient's body versus imaging. So like a full body CT or something like that, um, we can yield almost immediate results with the ability to see almost the entire body. And in some cases, watch to see what's happening live. So if we do PET, which is positon emission tomography, um, CT, we can kind of see what's going on and using a comparatively small amount of radiation. So again, the benefit there definitely outweighs 
the risk. Um, in nuclear medicine, um, and it's always interesting to me that we have patients come into a, a department labeled nuclear medicine. They say there's radiation here. Um, that nuclear medicine is where we actually take radioactive materials um, and we either inject them into the patients, they have to inhale it or consume it um, for the purpose of producing some kind of diagnostic physiologically based image. Um, post administration, so once the patient has either drank it, ate it, have it, had it injected, the patient is actually radioactive. Um, so because all radioisotopes have a half-life, typically the the um, isotopes that we use in nuclear medicine, their, their half-lives are hours to maybe a day or two. Um, the patient is really not radioactive for that long. We're only injecting really small quantities um, because the imaging equipment now allows us to get really great images just using small amounts of radiation. Um, but those patients are radioactive and they're able to, to go home from the hospital and there's really virtually no risk um, to the patient at all. Um, some of the precautions that we would give those patients are usually around um, for, for breastfeeding mothers. Um, we would tell, you know, you don't want to give an infant breast milk that could potentially be radioactive, but that's on the diagnostic side. Um, on the di diagnostic side, we also use x-rays and gamma rays. Um, we'll use them in outpatient radiography and angiography in the OR, um, up in the cardiac cath lab, and that's where we emit those x-rays from an x-ray tube onto the patient, um, and we're able to gather some images from them. So on the diagnostic side, uh, the use of radiation is extremely helpful. Um, it's a relatively small dose of radiation with pretty high quality image. Um, there's really low risk to the patient, um, but a very high benefit to the patient. Um, so on the therapeutic side, I usually refer to the diagnostic departments as the Wild West, because again, who would think that we'd be injecting patients with radioactive materials? Um, but on the therapeutic side, so if my diagnostic people are my Wild West, um, then on the therapy side, I kind of refer to them as the mafia, because their intent is to kill with radiation. Um, so what they're trying to do um, is use radioactive materials or very um, specific beams of radiation um, targeted at cancer and cancer cells, trying to kill it and spare the healthy tissue around it. So some of the more common treatments that we do would be iodine-131 treatments, um, brachytherapy, Y90, so that's just another isotope, and then the external beam radiation therapy. So again, um, it can be kind of confusing for patients because some of these patients are radioactive when they leave, some of them are not. Um, the patients who are radioactive are given precautions about what they need to do because they need the dose of radiation, but their family members don't. Um, so one example of this would be the iodine-131 therapy where we give them a radioiodine pill. That radioiodine emits both betas and gammas. The betas are killing off the thyroid tissue. Uh, the gammas are too, but they're also coming out of the patients. We usually say, hey, keep your distance, you know, be conscious of your bodily fluid and those sorts of things. So that's how we're using it on the therapeutic side. Um, radiation use in research, um, over the past, you know, my past 15 years in the field, um, I've seen it go down significantly with some new advances um, in, in chemoluminescence um, and other chemicals being used in lieu of radiation, but they do still use radiation quite a bit, um, and it really does enhance uh, research and make it possible for new imaging modalities to come out as well. Um, so many universities, colleges, even some high schools, I don't think they're using radiation in, at Burlington High, I'm not sure, um, but they use it quite a bit um, to do to do very important research. Even in vaccine research, um, you know, I was sitting on the last part of the meeting, uh, radioisotopes are used in vaccine research to, to trace where the certain materials go inside of the body when they they inject it. Um, another place in our everyday world where radiation is used is nuclear power. Um, so nuclear power reactors, which use uranium as fuel, um, they actually supply the U.S. with about 20 percent of our power. So, um, you know, we're over here on the East Coast, and in Burlington, we are situated right in between the Seabrook um, nuclear power plant in New Hampshire and Pilgrim nuclear power plant down in Plymouth. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Radiation Control Program is uh, fully in uh, responding to, to nuclear power accidents, and they actually do an exercise um, every year um, on nuclear power accidents. Um, but um, there's currently about 440 nuclear reactors used for energy around the world. I know it's a fairly controversial topic for some people, um, but there's a very interesting uh, documentary on Amazon Prime. Um, full disclosure, I'm just mentioning these things. I don't get any 
big bags for, for mentioning them. Um, but I thought this particular one, it's called Pandora's Promise, was very interesting. It's about people um, who were very uh, vocal, outspoken, and protesting nuclear power, who actually dug a little deeper into the science um, and are now pro nuclear power. So it's just very interesting. And it, it goes into also what the future of nuclear power will be um, on a global level. So it's kind of an interesting documentary uh, to watch. Um, on the industrial and commercial side, radiation is used um, in a, a very wide variety of ways. Um, so industrial radiography, it uses x-rays to check the weak points in metal parts and wells before products are sold, which is really important. Um, other examples of the use of radiation in industry, um, which also impacts the medical side, would be irradiators. So these machines use large, um, not physically, but high specific activity radiation sources to kill bacteria and other pathogens in food items. Um, they also use it um, in blood. So all blood is irradiated before it's used. Um, and once it's been treated with radiation, um, it prevents um, uh, transfusion associated graft host disease, which is really important. So once they discovered that, it made a huge difference um, in the effectiveness of blood transfusions. So that's, that's a really obviously important uh, use of radiation in the medical field. Um, and food irradiators are used very often. Um, I was actually very surprised um, because as a radiation safety officer, I'm trained to, you know, you don't talk about how much radiation you have or where you keep it. Um, but I saw at Wegmans in Burlington the other day, it said irradiated beef. And I said, why would they advertise that? Um, but the shelf life is actually longer. It kills off the bacteria. Um, it kills viruses. So it's, it makes it safer for people to eat, believe it or not. So um, when we went back to talking about um, being contaminated or being irradiated, this blood product and these, um, you know, the food that's irradiated, they are not radioactive. They are exposed to gamma rays or x-rays, but they do not become radioactive. It simply kills the bacteria in there or other pathogens um, that we don't want, and then it's totally safe to eat and use. So it does not become radioactive just to just to clarify that. Um, so there's a lot of uses of radiation that we've just kind of gone through fairly quickly. Um, and so people might ask, well, how does this happen? How does this happen safely? Is it really just anybody can use it? Anybody can handle it? Um, there's a lot of regulatory oversight um, for radiation safety, for protecting radiation workers, so people who handle or use radiation every day, um, for protecting the general public, and also for protecting the environment. Um, so there is a huge list here um, of just specific to the United States who oversees uh, the use of radiation and x-ray emitting devices and all of these other things that we spoke about. Um, so in Massachusetts, um, the Department of Public Health, we are an agreement state with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, which means that all of our regulations agree with the NRC, so we're able to handle the program on our own. So we have a radiation control program, and that control program issues licenses um, to different groups such as hospitals or research laboratories that are very specific, very, very specific about the who, what, when, where, why uh, people are using radioactive materials and x-ray emitting devices, and those are audited and, and um, you know, it's, it's kept kept pretty tight. Um, on the national level, the EPA, obviously, the NRC, Homeland Security is very involved with the regulatory oversight of uh, radioactive materials because these materials could, if they are not kept, uh, you know, under lock and key as they are supposed to be, if they get into the wrong hands, it could become uh, dangerous. Um, Department of Energy is involved with radioactive materials um, research and development, um, Department of Defense as well, um, and Department of Transportation, because a lot of these materials are transported on our streets um, every single day, and OSHA just for worker safety. Um, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with, with OSHA and what they do. Um, but all of these groups and all of us, even on an international level, follow this principle of radiation safety, which is called ALARA. Um, and that stands for keeping your dose as low as reasonably achievable. Um, so we know we live in a radioactive world. We know we go in and out of places where radioactive materials may be used. Um, it is not reasonable for us to keep ourselves inside of a leaded bubble, right? We can't do that. Um, so we want to try to keep our dose as low as reasonably achievable. And we can do that um, by limiting the amount of time we spend around radiation sources, um, keeping a distance between ourselves and radiation sources, um, and working behind appropriate shielding if you are a radiation worker. Um, and also contamination control. So if you're working in an area where they handle radioactive materials, um, we promote 
you know, contamination control and making sure people are positioning themselves in such a way so that they're not, not overexposed. So what does this mean for the general public? Um, so if you know you're going into a place where there's going to be radiation, so if you're taking your kid to the emergency department to get to get an x-ray, they probably won't let you in the room, or if they do, they'll ask you to keep a greater distance or perhaps wear a lead apron while you're in the room with them if you need to sit with them. Um, and these are all principles that we follow just to make sure that people's exposure stay as low as reasonably um, achievable. Um, but beyond the day-to-day, -day, if people were to get their hands on some of these larger radioactive materials, um, you know, there is the risk for radiological terrorism and adverse events. And that's not the primary um, goal of our discussion this evening. Um, hopefully this will lead into another discussion at another time um, about these sorts of events, but the type of events that are on, um, on the minds of, the, of our federal partners in emergency management um, that are, have the highest likeliness of occurring um, and also a big impact would be transportation accidents. So these materials that are going back and forth to hospitals and research labs, um, you know, we think about those sorts of things. We think about sources if somebody left one of these radiation sources behind, the bad things people could do with it, nuclear power plant accidents, and obviously improvised nuclear devices. So those are the different types of events that we look at that we want to be prepared for. Um, and again, that's absolutely a topic for, for a follow-up lecture that we can go into in a lot more detail. But those are the sorts of things um, that we want to be aware of um, and be prepared for. Um, so um, to wrap up, I think I'm doing okay with time here. Um, <laughs> radiation occurs naturally and can be man-made. Um, there are many positive uses which really benefit everyone. Um, there are plenty of controls in place to limit unnecessary exposure to people, places in the environment, um, and you want to make sure that you're using the right resources so that you can um, be aware um, and be prepared should something ever happen or if you come into a situation where you told, hey, you're going to be exposed to radiation for this medical purpose, um, you want to make sure you're able to ask the right questions um, and make the best decision um, for you. Um, so some of the resources that I'm leaving for you here are the EPA um, and the NRC, so the Environmental Protection Agency. They actually have a wonderful um, website that is geared towards middle and high school students, um, but I'm not going to lie, I have shared it uh, with some of the incoming physicians at different hospitals that I've worked at because it's just kind of a, a real great primer on radiation and they tend to love it. It's called Rad Town, um, but it's also just a really interesting way to see uh, where radiation is used you know, again, in everyday life. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they also have some educational sites, but they have some um, good articles and fact sheets that you can read. Um, on the emergency management, like the medical side, um, REMS is a really great resource, and REACTS, which comes out of um, some of the government laboratories, so there's some really great things. And then there's all these, um, you know, different, the American College of Radiology, um, Image Wisely, um, and um, NCRP, which is the National Council on Radiation Reports, that are kind of dry reading, um, but the first few resources are kind of interesting to look through if you're ever looking for, for really good resources. Um, let's see. Um, I also put at the end of the presentation, I'm not sure if this is going to go out to um, the attendees, um, but I also put some of the quantities and units that can get really confusing um, when you start talking about radiation, about grays and sieverts and person sieverts and absorbed dose and effective dose. I didn't dive into those tonight tonight um, because they are pretty pretty heavy, <laughs> um, but these are some really great um, definitions of what they are um, and what they mean and why it's actually useful. Um, so I have my contact information there, so if people ever have any further uh, questions, they are always welcome to call or shoot me an email. Um, and I guess at this point, I will open it up to Q&A.